I showed him and told him why I was going to be the best call center manager in the history of the world. And he said, I'm going to give you the shot. And at 19 years old, this company, Teleperformance, moved me from Provo, Utah to Yakima, Washington. And their call center, at the time, Teleperformance had 52 call centers and Yakima was ranked 52nd in profitability and billable hours. And six months later, we were number one across the board. We were the number one center in the business. And I was like, I'm going to do this the rest of my life. I was making fat cash. I was making $32,000 a year. Ooh, and, big. Whoa. And, and look at, at, at a 19 year for a 19 year old, like I was rolling in the dough. Welcome to the small business safari where I help guide you to avoid those traps, pitfalls and dangers that lurk when navigating the wild world of small business ownership. I'll share those gold nuggets of information and invite guests to help accelerate your ascent to that mountaintop of success. It's a jungle out there, and I want to help you traverse through the levels of owning your own business that can get you bogged down and distract you from hitting your own personal and professional goals. So strap in, Adventure Team, and let's take a ride through the safari and get you to the mountaintop. All right, Alan, here we go again with another great episode with another good friend of mine who loves to keep me accountable. He is totally putting you in check already. And that's why I said, just hit record. Hit record. He already insulted the podcast. He did. He goes, yeah, I listened to the podcast <laughs> and it's not very good. That's not not very good. We heard. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we have Don Markham from Accountability Now on, who was a business coach of mine. Uh, and we have stayed friends uh, since I, I have not been with him for a little bit, but uh, he's always right there and always been help, able to help me out a lot. So I'm excited to have Don on. But before we get to Don, I got to tell you what we're doing right after we get done with this podcast, Alan. You're packing to go to Tahoe. I know. I'm packing to go to Tahoe, baby. <sighs> Tahoe and then Napa Valley. Ten days in the beautiful Nevada, California wine countries. How's cell service out there so you can stay in touch with your business? Right, Don? Uh, well, no, actually. Like, I want, like, you know, it's a good point. So business owners really struggle at taking breaks all the time. They think I got to be connected all the time. I got to <clears> check in all the time. And if you're doing that, then you're not doing it right. Like if he wants, if you really want to grow your business, uh, you need to learn how to take a break and recharge and come back and win. And now I, Chris is doing it wrong. I'm sure he's making mistakes. He, well, I refuse you know, to give him a compliment. You remember Harvey but. Pennick, the golf coach, he said, you know, you just take one aspirin at a time, not the whole bottle. So obviously you told Chris, maybe you should take a little break every now and then. And now he's in tahoe and then vegas and then mexico yeah and then like barcelona Chris, it should be hey maybe you should work once in a while yeah I think just so. a little just a little just yeah. to, you know but i'm trying but but don hit on it you know you got to be able to get back and recharge right do all that what happens when you overcharge your batteries don you like take too much of a break you take too yeah. much time off um, doesn't that reduce your something. battery life yeah well I, you're taking the metaphor to a bizarre level um, um yeah, and so this deal. is by the way this is where the feet this is where the podcast goes you, you know you take metaphors to weird levels but uh yes, joking sir. aside i would say taking breaks is super important um because it helps your business fuel but it also you have so many people in your business that depend on you and you have made them depend on you and by you stepping away it gives them the chance to step up and actually perform and too many entrepreneurs and small business owners rob people of their greatest gift, which is struggle. They rob them of failure because they're like, oh, you don't care about it like I do. And I'm going to jump in and save you. And I'm going to do it my way. Well, you became great because you learned how to suck. You learned how to fail and get back at it. So you going on a break, lets See? them fail and grow and get better. So that, here's what I did right before this podcast started is uh, one of my uh, estimators has sold a set of attic stairs that we can't find. I was looking for it, and I said, hey, can't do it. And I, I kicked it back over to my operations manager, and he said, I'm on it, sir. I will find it. I'm like, yes, you will. Go struggle and fail for me, big boy. So, no, he won't do yeah. that. But, uh, but That's outstanding. It was. I like it. Yeah, it actually, it, it, it was good because I, I was looking for a little bit, and I went, screw this. You know, He, he can do it. He's, he's way better at this than I am. So, so Don's saying it. you have to embrace the suck in order to be great. That's but, or, I mean, let them embrace the stock. Your employees, you yeah. know, up to the occasion, and then they feel like they filled in the void, right? They have a little, they feel good about it. 
Yeah. Stop going in and thinking you have to protect them from failure. They and remember both. I mean, Chris knows this. I mean, Chris was a bad manager his entire life. He's was. yet to be good. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Yes. But his entrepreneurship skills, like Chris, when you left corporate America and decided to become an entrepreneur and you had to go through all this failure in order to build it. Sometimes we do this, not only as business leaders, we do this as parents. We don't want to let our kids fail. We want to come in and step for them because we we think we're doing them a service when all we're doing is allowing them to be average and then be frustrated when they're average. Let yeah. them fail. Let them struggle because it's the greatest gift you're going to give them. Yep. Failing forward is always a great point uh, to do that. And we, we do that in sales all the time with our guys is that you're out there running a call with them and you're like, nope. You know, I know the answer and I'm not going to let you, I'm, he looked at me and like, Hey, Chris, any feedback on that? I'm like, no, I really wasn't paying attention, man. Uh, why, why don't you guys just finish it? I just did it the guy yesterday and, yeah, uh, right. and he was able to, he was, well, you're not really sure, uh, but let me get back to you. And, uh, he, uh, he won the job this morning. So pretty cool. There it is. Yeah. So Don, you did not start out as a business coach. You, uh, I, uh, you have a really great background where you were in the theater, right? Uh, yes, you, sir. and you, uh, also, now, did you have entrepreneurial parents? How did this whole thing start? Because uh, let's talk a little bit about how you got started and what you do and what you do uh, today. I love that. That's that's a great question. Um, so no, it's I, not done, and it's not a great question. That's right. It's I the know. question. Look, you, you have to make him feel good, or he'll whine. And well, there is whine. that. He does pout yeah, too. So, Don't forget pouting. Yeah, yeah. This is Chris management one hundred and one. <laughs> Right. So there's a, there's a whole group thread that we have on you know, with people in Atlanta. Can I get on that? Yeah. I'll send you an invite. All right. I so uh, I was, you know, when I was in college, I was a musical theater major. And I, I thought for sure I was going to go to Broadway and be the next great big star. And I even had a scholarship to NYU um, at one point uh, in their voice uh, and musical program. And my wife and I were married at the time. Uh, we're still married, but at the time we were very young, married with one son. And I remember I got this scholarship from NYU. And this is back when we you got letters, not emails, right? right. I don't know if you guys can remember that far back, okay? But um, so right. I had this letter, a papyrus. With this, yeah, I had this scroll um, that was sent to me <laughs> from a, a runner, um, and I. Well, I, you know, my sitting talking about my, with my wife, what, what do we do? And I'll never forget how awesome it was, how supportive she was. She said, look, my fear is not the grind of going to New York and trying to make it. My real fear is I think you're going to make it. And if you make it right, remember what the life that means. We live in the city, eight shows a week, you know, this whole lifestyle, boom, bang, 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 bang. And she goes, but I'm going to support you either way. If this is what you want to do, if this is what you think we should take our family towards, let's do it. So she goes to bed, sat there in the kitchen. I'm a religious person. So I prayed and then I got up and I tore that scholarship and I put it in the garbage and never told him, right? I just tore it up. And then the next morning I changed my major to finance and that was it. And that, and that was it. Went into business. But you still were doing musical theater. That was uh, for fun and still as yeah. like where you playing music and stuff. So very much come out. And what was your first job out of school? Or what, what were those jobs that led up to where you are? Where you are now. So my, my, my very first job, what, like my first big boy, my big boy job was, uh, I was working at a call center. He is very theatrical. He is. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. We That's why it'll be on YouTube. We've never had anybody sing on our show before. We've had, yeah. we had somebody oh, play an instrument. I've actually listened. I've, I, I've heard him sing because he's he uh, goes and sings for people in Jacksonville, and they were streaming it, and uh, it was pretty. He's good, man. I'll give it to you. Yeah, oh, I'm I'm really good. Like, let's not mess around. <laughs> okay. Yes. Like I, I I'm really good. I've done karaoke kind in of Atlanta, a big deal. right? And I'm. And I dominated. You brought down the house at karaoke. I'm a competitive karaoke. Let's just say that. <laughs> that I show a competitive up. Competitive karaoke, baby. Like I show up and I watch people sing and I'm like, I'm going to beat them. I'm going to beat them. I'm going to bury gonna you. Yep. So I uh, get this big boy job. It's call centers. I'm doing outbound calls, like gritty credit card sales back in the late nineties. Brutal. And after two weeks, I was really good. And a job opening came up for a, um, a supervisor. And here I was 18 years old and I applied for it. And I still remember my little buddies around me like, you can't do that. You're 18 years old. You've only been here two weeks. Like you're crazy. And I said, Hey, you don't know me. Like, you don't know what I can do. 
So I applied for it and I went and met with my boss at the time. Her name was Kim Clegg. She's a big Baltimore Orioles fan. Stupid. Like what? That's worse. Yeah. What an the idiot. Worst. I know. Yep. And I met with Kim and I told her why I was going to be the best call center supervisor in the history of the world and showed her this whole thing. And she gave me the job and I was making six twenty five an hour and I had my own team of 25 reps. And then about three, maybe five months later, we were the number one team in the site and the assistant call center manager, like the number, like the right hand person opened. So I applied for it. And again, all my buddies were like, you're nuts, you're 18. Like you haven't even been here a year. And I said, you don't know me. Like, don't tell me what I can't do. And I went and met with Kim again and told her why I was going to be the best right-hand person in the history of the world. Showed her this whole, we didn't have PowerPoint back then. We had like a different thing that we were using to do presentations. And I showed her that and she gave me the job and I did that. And we started having awesome shifts. And I started at that time, I started really reading a lot around John Maxwell. I know you guys know John Maxwell stuff. Right. So I was reading, I was obsessing over leadership and I was reading Ziegler, Zig Ziglar, I was reading sales leadership and all this stuff. And my team, the whole shift started just accelerating. We became outstanding. And then I was, uh, night, I turned 19 and an actual call center manager position opened up with this company in Yakima, Washington. So I applied and it, even Kim told me, he's like, Don, this is for people in their thirties and forties, like you're 19. And I was like, Kim, you don't know me. Give me a break. And I drove up to Salt Lake city and I met with Greg Borland, who became one of the great mentors of my life. He's a Lieutenant Colonel in the military. And I showed him and told him why I was going to be the best call center manager in the history of the world. And he said, I'm going to give you the shot. And at 19 years old, this company teleperformance moved me from Provo, Utah to Yakima, Washington. And their call center at the time, teleperformance had 52 call centers and Yakima was ranked 52nd in profitability and billable hours. And six months later, we were number one across the board. We were the number one center in the business. And I was like, I'm going to do this the rest of my life. I was making fat cash. I was making $32,000 a year. Ooh, and, big. Whoa. And, and look at, at, at a 19 year for a 19 year old, like I was rolling in the dough. Sure. And I gotta, I gotta ask you, was it just please. like you, you were young and fearless or you had this theater background? Did you just think of this as yes. a show? I mean, um, that's a really so, hard industry. And, yeah. So theater. So I, I, and I, this is one of the reasons I'm a big fan of the arts and I encourage people to do it because it gives you fearless confidence. Um, and Chris knows this because we've talked about it. Confidence is an infectious thing that is hard to ignore, right? You look at the greatest leaders in history, good or bad, good or bad. They were confident right? They just, they show up with confidence and people are like, I don't know what it is. I'm just drawn to this confidence. Here I was 19, fearless. I was reading, you know, 40 to 50 books a year. I mean, I was obsessed with trying to be better and I would, I was confident and I, uh, that, and I, I know my theater background helped, but it was kind of a combination of all of it. Yeah. So coming in with the so, confidence and getting the team going and getting, and then going from 52nd to first, as yeah. you were making those steps, what are the when you look back on it, what are the things that you felt like you did to help the team get to that point? And that because that's building that skill yeah. later on for being an entrepreneur. So exactly one hundred percent. So the first thing I did, and now this was a little scary. It's a great story. You guys will love this. So <laughs> I, you know, nineteen, super fearless, super cocky, and Yakima, Washington. I didn't learn this until I'd lived there for a while. Had the number one. The, the it had the highest ranking of crime gang related crime per capita in the United States. That little city did. Okay. Um, I thought it was just an apple orchard town. It, yeah. Well, there's a lot of apple orchards. There's a lot of picking. There's a lot of, uh, you know, it requires a lot of, there was a lot of immigrant groups that came up there, which led to gang violence. And I'm not saying that they're all tied to gangs for immigrants, right? I want to keep your show PC, but yeah. Uh, um, but That'll be it, the they first had, time it's been PC. Yeah, I know. Right? They had, We're they had truckloads of gangs. And so when I showed up, my first, I still remember my first day of the job. They introduced me and I'm looking over this group of 150 employees that are now my employees. And I'm telling you, half of them at least were gang thug bangers, like staring at me like, 
who's this white kid from Utah, right? This Mormon kid, right? And so I would walk around fearless. I just started firing them. Hey, I think you're toxic to the behavior of here. It's one strike. And I just literally started like, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired. One time I fired this kid, kid, Geraldo. And all of a sudden the next day his brother came in and his brother came in. Hey, where's, where's the boss? Where's the boss? And, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm all tough. (laughs) And Geraldo got in my face and he was like, nobody fires my family. You better watch your back. And I was putting on a front, like, get out of here, man. He leaves. And I'm like crying in the bathroom. I'm so scared. Oh my God. I'm going to get killed. (laughs) And then no joke that night I went home to my apartment and on my, on my car, but the next morning when I woke up on my my car was a piece of paper that said, leave town tomorrow. Wow. And I was like, I am here. I'm, I'm 19. Right. And I peed an immense amount in my pants. I was just like, Oh my gosh. And I called human resource for this company. Tell performance is a multi-billion dollar company. They were back then. So I called HR, told them what happened. And this is why my, where my first love of HR came. They said, well, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> How helpful. And I was, Thank you. And I was like, what do you do? <laughs> like, what does HR even do? And so I had no choice. That but to is keep a good on, question. On. Yeah. So I just kept on and I thought I'm doing it right. Be smart. Right. Don't be alone in an alley. Like just, you know, do my thing. And I started going to work really early before anybody got there and staying way late. So like, um, anyway, we got rid of people that were not contributing to the culture of, of the, of the business. And by doing that, that allowed me to put people that understood our mission and what my mission was. I was, I was big into Stephen Covey. I still am. So I had my own little team mission statement of what we were going to do. Uh, And, you know, when we'd interview people, I'd ask them, here's my mission statement. What does it mean to you? And tell me, tell me what this means to you. And we only brought in people. I don't want to use exaggerate. We tried to only bring in people. We weren't perfect. um, That supported the mission of what we were trying to do as a sales call center. And it worked. That I mean, that's big. You know, we talk about this. What's that phrase? Culture eats strategy for lunch. Uh, and you got to build that culture if you want to start to make that change. So you started, cause that wasn't a day one fix. I mean, you didn't go from 52 to one in a day and a yeah. day doesn't make it happen. I mean, obviously there's a lot of work. But, so the first thing was culture, a mission statement, and then starting to find the right people and get them in the right seats. Yeah, exactly. The Jim Collins statement, which I didn't learn until years later of getting the right people in the right seats. Um, and then I was studying so much about sales. We were a sales call center and I learned that the the first real principle of sales is momentum. Okay. You guys are sports guy. Well, you're Atlanta Braves fan. So I don't know if you're sports fans, yeah. okay, but, and who do you um, follow? I follow the New York Mets and the Green Bay Packers. And you're talking so about momentum oh. on the Mets. There it is. It's a trick. Okay. 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 Boy, here it is. Do they still play baseball? This is getting salty. Yeah. It's, getting really, <laughs> it's getting really salty here. Okay. Yeah. All, All right. So, so let's imagine the Mets had momentum. Go ahead with your story. So I learned that sales was about momentum more than anything. Like there's so many techniques to learn scripting. Yes. You got to have that. You got to have training. I know Chris, big, he and I have aligned on training. You got to train every day. You got to have all these things, but without momentum, it just doesn't matter. And too many times we spend so much time on process and getting the right people and getting all this stuff, making sure they can send invoices correctly. We try, but the sales team never gets momentum. And you guys have seen this in sports, a team that doesn't have momentum. They're losing. Yeah. They're losing to, I've seen in sports is such a great example. Great teams lose to horrible teams that they should have never lost to. George has done this many, many times. They've been a great team. And they lost to horrible teams. And it was because of momentum. Well, they didn't get out coached. They didn't, they, the other team got momentum early. And then they were like, wow, I don't know what to do. And then they just kind of roll over. So that's, that's that nine, reminds me of a story when that happened for me, just real quick. I got to get, so please. I'm, I'm doing little league baseball with my, uh, with my friend and we're coaching together and in little league baseball, it's rec ball. So everybody has to play so many innings in the infield and so many innings in the outfield. And everybody's got to have a chance to play and do that stuff. And, and so I was doing that and I was trying to develop the worst players in the beginning and we were getting throttled, man, we were getting killed. And my coach came up to me and said, Chris, can, can we just stack the deck once these kids need a win? Just let's get them <laughs> a win. Sure enough, we did it. We go get the win. 
Then we go back and do a little bit of each, a little bit of this. Next thing you know, boom, 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 boom. Last year we were in last place. Uh, this year we, we that year we won the uh, we won the whole league. And, there it is. But it's momentum. Back to your point. Even with kids, momentum. No, it's, so, it's human. It's I mean it's it's gravity. It's the law of gravity. Well, it's, and this is a scientific law. It's a huge right. thing, and I and I love this conversation because when you're on a hot streak in sales, you're bulletproof. You know you're going to get the next one, and you can't wait. And you start bragging, and then you know our last podcast is it, like, let's see if we can break a piece of the customer's furniture and still close the deal. But then when yeah. the momentum goes dark, it's like, oh my god, how am I ever going to sell this next one? And there's a lot of pressure. How do you fix it? How do you turn it around? So, so go back to you know, I'm not trying to use lame sports metaphors. So I hope you guys can keep up. I use sports references and I know you don't really know it. Yeah. I can use more musical theater references. <laughs> Chris might get the sound. Uh, uh, so in basket, in sport of basketball, this is a oh, print cats, coaching Chris. in basketball. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In, in basketball, the role of the timeout is a pure usage of momentum. That's all the coach uses it for. So if the opposing team scores six in a row or seven in a row or eight in a row, that coach knows timeout before this turns into 20 in a row. <laughs> let's run a play that we know we can score on and let's stop this dang thing. Right. And that's the role of it. So if you're, if I have a sales rep that's gone, we, in fact, in my sales team now, they have the O, we have a called the O for three rule. It's called the O for rule. O for three. If you have over, if you go over, you have to speak to me personally. Right. Like you don't take another lead. Don't take another call. Talk to me. And let's time out. Let's run a play. Let's get the layup. And I did that same thing way back when I was 19 at that call center. I was like, okay, momentum's everything. So if you go over three, time out, you come meet with me personally. And I mean, I did, I just get them training. I get them focused, get them motivated. Let's get them a hot lead. Like let's do something that makes this break the, make break the run. And momentum changed that call center. It's changed every business. When I do my business coaching, right? The first thing we try to do is get, like when I was working with Chris, right? The first thing was let's get revenue up fast. Let's go, 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 go and create momentum because when there's momentum, the business owner is like, oh, let's, let's go to Athens. Let's do this. Let's do this. Like we can do anything because I've got momentum. Do you have what it takes to start your own business? Are you tired of the nine to five corporate job and ready to make that leap into entrepreneurship? You need to check out From the Zoo to the Wild, the book by successful entrepreneur, Chris Lalomia. This book is a unique perspective on the journey into the wild world of home services and delivering excellence in service while working in customers' homes. Lalomia shares his path to success in this industry including proven customer relationship strategies, award-winning customer experience processes, and a unique approach to training a team of service technicians to perform at the highest levels. Whether you're a small business trying to scale or a franchise operation, From the Zoo to the Wild will give you the mindset, habits, leadership style, and customer-oriented processes to succeed as a small business owner in the world of home services. So if you're ready to take control of your future, get a copy of From the Zoo to the Wild today, available on Amazon. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, the momentum and the breaking of the momentum is another one. I, I think that's that's key. When a sales guy's on a heater, it's easy to stay off him. But when he's in that deep dark spot and come back saying, oh, I can't my you know, price, it's all price, it's all price. You just you gotta say, Time out, right? Stop. We know Time price out. is fifth in the list, That's man. Right. So let's go, let's go find it. Let's get you a win. So how do you make sure your team has momentum when you're in Napa Valley for 10 days? I'm not in well, Napa for 10. I'm in Napa for four. I was in Tahoe for six. So a total of 10. That's right. But so, I mean he's, momentum. he's got Yep. And he's got to have a team, right? He's got to have a team that can do it. Or he's got to have a team that can do it. And remember what momentum is. And I talk about this with gravity, right? So if I'm, I mean, you all know Indiana Jones, right? So that mm -hmm. the big boulder that rolls down, right? The big, the big fancy thing. It doesn't, once it starts to move a little bit, it's going to get faster and faster and faster as it goes down. All I got to get it to do is move a little bit. That's it. That's the principle of momentum. 
we think we have to do these big, enormous things. No, just go sell a box of pencils to somebody, right? Like just get a little movement and that ball's going to roll downhill. And that's how easy it is. Yeah, I, I, uh, it, it's true because that's what happens with our sales guys. You can see them when they go in the up and downs and they all have them. I mean, it, it's it's a natural cycle of everything. And when they get in that down spot, man, you just you cannot tell them that there's a sunshine coming. Don't worry about it. Those aren't all clouds. No, no, no. All I can see are clouds. No, don't worry. The sun's yeah. behind there. No, nope, no. Nope. It's just, this isn't working. And you yeah. got to find a way to break that. Your... And oh, yeah. I'll give you an example, like what I would do in like larger sales teams that I'm coaching with. We got one guy. He's 0 for 3, 0 for 5, 0 for 7. He's in the dark clouds. Okay. He's soup. He's a Mets fan. He's miserable. He's, you know, he's really upset. Okay. <laughs> Way to take one. And, yep. And so now I got to break this. Okay. So let's look. Do I really want to give this guy a lead right now? Probably not. Okay. Right. I want my leads to go to closers. So, but I got to break the momentum. So I'm going to say, hey, uh, let's say this crappy salesperson, I'm going to make up a name. Let's call him Chris. Okay. Let's <laughs> say this crappy salesperson is Chris. <laughs> Okay, I'll just pick a random name. Just, right. Just, yeah. Let's just pick one of the shall we? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yep. So Chris, I'm going to say, so how do I get momentum? Remember, I just got to get a little movement, right? So I might say, hey, Chris, man, I'm working with this guy, Tom over here, and he's really struggling. You want to come watch me do, you and me watch him do a sale, maybe give him some feedback. Because remember the principle of endorphins. Okay. Every time we teach somebody, every time, Chris knows this because he's a teacher at heart. Every time we teach somebody something and they go, wow, and you see them learn it, I get an endorphin rush. Yeah. And I start to think, man, I know this. So I'm literally manipulating the situation to hack his brain. So I'm going to say, Chris, let's go look at this. Now, we can watch any salesperson. They're going to have gaps. And I'm going to say, Chris, what do you think? What would you do? I'm like, oh, what I would do is this. I do this and I do this. And the guy goes, oh my gosh, that's great. Those are good ideas. Boom, momentum. And he didn't close the deal. I just got momentum. Mm-hmm. And then when I'm walking back, with Chris, I say, dude, that's good feedback. You know what you're doing. You know how to close this yeah. stuff. Go get now, it. Now he's got his belief system back. And now because, you know, again, the other adage is that a salesman only s- sells at their lowest level of belief in either the product or the service they're trying to sell. And now he's got the belief and he's like, wait a minute. Yeah. You know what? I got this. Stuff. I do know this. Yeah. And you're, I'm using biology to win because, because I got him to teach. His endorphins will kick on. doesn't matter who he is. Every single person that teaches and when somebody acknowledges it, their brain just goes and they get these little goosebumps. And they're like, I'm the savior. I'm the greatest person in the world. Like they just feel on top of the world. Well, it gets you Great. back to basics too, the back to the blocking and tackling. I mean, some of the best golf I've ever played is right after somebody else says, Hey, you know, I don't play, but can you show me a few things? And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be your teacher, but I'll work you through some drills and stuff. And next thing you know, I'm like, Oh yeah, maybe I should be doing that and yeah, yeah you know is. what and then i'm yeah maybe it is just backing through yeah you, yeah, you actually exactly. hit another one uh, down yeah. to big golfer so that's uh there you go you actually hit an analogy he's, he's gonna pick up on that is that right i think he's gonna yeah. run with it too many times Get away from baseball too many, look too many times we think working with a sales rep means i have to go coach them i have to teach them I've, there's so many ways to hack their brain and get them confident have them do the teaching have them teach you right like I'll, I might go to a sales rep that's struggling and be like, man, I'm really struggling with my pitch on this thing. I'm going to give me some feedback. Let's role play. Like, why do I always have to be the one to teach them? Sometimes I, my goal is momentum. That's it. That's my goal. Yeah. Not making me look good. I don't care. I want this guy to have momentum. Look close. So sell some crap. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and when they start teaching each other, then you see that you see the win there. And that's, that's where we are right now with Goody B, my sales manager. Uh, he is the teacher and the primary guy in the sales side uh, teaching. And, and that's that's key. And that's it's always great to watch that where he's actually giving good feedback and the team's responding to him. It makes yeah. you feel better as an owner. That's right. That's when you can go to Napa and do those things because you have somebody that's doing that. That's how. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, Don, you left the uh, incredibly Stroking fun world ego. of call centers, which... Um, I remember building call centers back in the day, but these were service centers for uh, banks and they're there. It's a tough environment and it, it's closed. It's eight hours. It's a grind. You were doing outbound sales even harder because you don't get the rush of being in, in somebody's house, which is fun for us and home services. When did you break out and why did you end up leaving the call center? Was it burnout? Was it opportunity? No, uh, no, and no. Um, so uh, we, we, I was with this call center. Come, I eventually have teleperformance and joined another one. 
and I found myself, I was 25 years old. I was the vice president of sales and operations. We we're about 7 million in size. And I, you know, on a lot of things on paper showed I was doing really well, right? I had a good six figure salary. I'm now 25 with a great six figure salary. I've got my beautiful wife and three kids. And, but I was about 60 pounds heavier than I am now. I was on an airplane 25 times a year going to all these different call centers. And I started thinking there's got to be a better way to do this. And I still remember sitting in this break room in Rock Falls, Illinois. We'd just done a big sales training with like 150 reps. And I was sitting in the break room, polishing off a chalupa from Taco Bell. I don't know if you've ever had a chalupa from Taco Bell, but it's so freaking good. Yes. Right? There's a making me really so hungry right now. All right. Thanks, and so Bob. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, this can't be what my life is. 60 hours a week, just grind and grind and grind. And that's when I took out this little notebook that I used to carry around with me that had quotes in it. And I read this quote by a guy named Bob Proctor that said, accountability is the glue that ties commitment to results. And I was like, man, that's cool. And so I sat there and I wrote down the four C's of accountability, which was my own personal mantra about how I was going to be more accountable in my life and how I was going to understand accountability from then on. And I took that little mantra and I started to live it first. And as I did, like magic things happened. I lost weight. I started to spend more time at home. My wife liked the thinner me, which was a bonus. That was super great. <laughs> and, and my business started to do well. And I started to teach that accountability model to my team. And they started to do well. And this business grew from seven to 12 to 25 up to 45 million. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm the greatest executive in the history of mankind. This, I'm a genius. And this is the way I think God works. That sometimes right when we think we've got it all figured out, he reminds us that we don't. And I'm 26 on cloud nine and my wife gets diagnosed with cancer. Hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, like everything, everything changed in an instant. And, you know, here we have three kids under the age of six. And, and look, I, I don't mind saying this, but I feel bad saying it. I remember being angry with God because I remember thinking, look, I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't swear. And you give my wife cancer. Hmm. I can think of, I can think of a lot of people that deserve this more than I do. And the next few years was tough, but we got through it because of the four C's we got through it. Cause we, we're accountable to each other. And we knew what that meant. And as we came out the other side, I remember telling my wife, you know, I wouldn't wish these two years on my worst enemy. And at the same time, I wish everybody could go through this because I have a better relationship with you, with kids, with God. I'm a better father, husband, entrepreneur, executive brother, manager, cousin, you name it. Everything's better because we went through this. And it was right after that, the president of the company came to me and he's like, Don, I'm going to look and do some philanthropic work. And we had met with the board and we're looking at naming you president. And I'm like, I'm not even 30. I'm going to be president of this company. And then I got this vision of, I'm already traveling 25 times a year. We're going to keep growing. What am I going to travel 50 times a year? Like, this is not for me. And I came back to him and said, I got a better idea. Maybe, maybe I walk away and found my replacement sold some of my shares back in the business and didn't and left and decided we're going to do this different. And that's when I joined a startup at full entrepreneur mode. And uh, I put uh, some money in, I became a co-owner of this business. And this is where I made my first real mistake in business. I joined a business as an owner without looking at the financials. Oops. <laughs> All right. Here and, we go. Yeah. And I jump in. And I remember Bubba was his name. He shows me the financials and we were losing about $10,000 a month. And I was like, Bubba, like, this is a terrible business. Like, what are we doing? Like, we're losing 10 grand a month. Every hour we're open, we're losing money. And he said, yep, I know. That's why you're here. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. And the next kind of, I don't know, five, six months was awful. We were losing money worse. I was making it worse. 
And because I was doing every mistake entrepreneurs do, I throw money at it, right? Hire, hire more people, hire do this and get more. Oh, what do I need? Software. Software will save me. And everything was making it worse. We were an outbound lead generation and marketing agency is what we were doing. And I still remember this moment. I called my wife one day. I had, a, I had about an hour and a half commute to work every day. And I called her and I was complaining and whining. This job sucks. This business sucks. I should go back to my old job. I could get in a heartbeat. You know, I had a travel budget. I had all this stuff. And now I'm losing our money, our li like livelihood. Everything is just going down the tubes. And my amazing wife, she's let me go through that. And then she said, are you done whining? And I said, yes. And she said, good. I'm sick of it. <laughs> Lucky. And this is true as anything. She said these exact words. Lucky for you. I didn't marry a loser. Ah, I like it. You, Yep. She goes, you've been complaining for weeks and I'm tired of it. From no now chalupas on, for you. Yeah. Right. She said, only call me when you have solutions. Only call hey. me when you're going to have the, something to solve. Otherwise, maybe you are the problem. And then she closed it with, only call me when you're going to talk about the four C's. And then she hung up the phone. Do you think that she got that kind of toughness because of what she went through? Would she have said that if she hadn't gone through that struggle? Uh, that's a great, that's a great, great question. I mean, my wife's me always, my wife's always been the greatest person I've ever known from day one. Of course, I mean, she fell in love with me, so she's obviously great, but she's incredible. She's always been incredible. She's always been ambitious. She, she had been a senior executive for a company in Utah. She was more successful than I was earlier on. And so she always had grit for sure. Hmm. But, but crisis illustrates our true character doesn't create it right Great. crisis exposes what was already there and makes it bigger and so i think sure she was grittier right the, you know the sandpaper had made her skin tougher but i would say she's always been the toughest woman i've ever met that's awesome yeah so you've mentioned the four c's twice do we have to pay you to get the four c's or can you tell us no i look th that's another thing in business what i tell entrepreneurs all the time is give it away for free because they're not going to follow it anyway. They'll hire you, <laughs> right? Give it all away for free. Because guess what? They don't have the discipline to do it, right? <laughs> so give it all away. And they'll be so intrigued and they'll fail a hundred times and they'll come back to you. Uh, uh, personal weight loss and fitness proves this. Give, you, you think there's not, you know, weight loss programs for free online? There's thousands of them. But why? So the, why would you ever hire a personal trainer? Because you know, you're never going to follow it. Never going to follow it. Never, never in a million years. So Four C's are really easy and this will be uh, really impactful and I'm sure it'll change your lives forever. Um, God, the first, yeah, yeah. So the first thing before we get to the exact four C's is we have to cover the two rules because we all have a misunderstanding of what accountability is. We think accountability is always associated with negative consequence and you both already do this and you don't even realize it. When somebody screws up, you tell your sales manager, you need to hold them accountable. That's right. You need to hold it's them accountable. We, it's a we negative only word. Bring, we only bring it up on the mistake. And accountability is associated with all of your choices. Yep. I want you to be accountable for your wins just as much as your losses. The fact that Chris has taken a break, I want to hold him accountable. Chris, great job. It was awesome. Right. When a salesperson crushes it, I'm going to pull him off and say, hey, you follow these three techniques. Great job. Like that's exactly what I want. I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to say that word. I want their brain to associate it with the right behaviors, not just when I screw up because yep. we all do that. And we do it to ourselves more than anything. We just crush ourselves when we make a mistake. But then when you do it right, you do this, I'm being humble. No, you know, it just, uh, it was right. somebody else. I had guidance. Just stop that. Tell yourself, Man, I kicked freaking ass at that. Like I was awesome that I made those decisions and I feel better about it. That's not being cocky. You're holding yourself accountable. This one's it's hard to do. Uh, when Don was working with me, uh, we talked about this word. I was actually uh, trying to make this the word of the year for my company, but it's got su such a negative connotation. You really got to put that in your culture to get it going. So we do talk about that. Now we're we, we celebrate the wins uh, and we, we, we don't say the word accountable, but we definitely celebrate the wins and we celebrate the losses. Hey, you know what? That was a good loss. That's all right. That all right. So what's the, the, what's the C word? So, Did I miss it? So, no. So I haven't. So the, that's just our definition. And the two rules are oh. really quick. The first rule 
is accountability always starts with me. We don't walk into a room and point at other people. We realize we contribute to our own future more than anything else. And so I wanted to ask you about that because the way you were describing it, it seemed like you were holding yourself accountable. Whereas when I think of accountability, I think of accountability partners. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you always, it always starts with yourself. Always. Okay. I contributed to that. I made that. I, I made those. I contributed. Okay. And the second thing is there's no room for egos. Anyone can hold you accountable. And I use a little simple metaphor, right? So let's say there's a baseball game. And if there was, if a pitcher throws a pitch and it's a swing and a miss, that's a strike. And it doesn't matter if the umpire calls it a strike or a, the opposing player calls it a strike or a fan in the stands calls it a strike. You swung and you missed. It's a strike. But we spend all this energy when somebody tells us, calls us out on something of, hey, you know, it's not your job to tell me where I screwed up. Or we'll say things like, well, yeah, but will you do it too? Who gives a freaking crap that they do it too? Of course they do. Right. That means they're an expert at it. It didn't mean you didn't screw up. Get over it. Okay. Drop the ego. Anyone can hold you accountable from your spouse to your kids, to your lowest level ranking employee, to a stranger on the street and get over yourself. You aren't above it. Those are the two rules. I know. Trust me. I have a lot of that. (laughs) Yeah. All right. And now the four C's are real easy. Okay. First one is, first one is critique success. We do it better every time. Whenever we win, we the, before we break our wrist, pat ourselves on the back, we stop and say, how could it have been better? How could we do this better? Okay, that's our first discussion. Second one is we correct failure. Chris knows this because he's really big on this. We don't punish mistakes. We correct them. If somebody makes a mistake, he already talked about it, we're going to celebrate it. We're going to tell the team, awesome job. You had a huge mistake and let's break it down. Oh, you made that assumption based on this data and now can you see how that was a little rash and a little wrong? Okay, fix that. Go left, not right, and everything's fine. Okay, right? If Marty McFly and Doc Brown had just tore up the book or burned it, then Biff Tannen would have never gone back in time and, and created the whole second movie. <laughs> Correct the mistake. That's it. There it, you go. It's a little little uh, pop culture reference. Love it. And yep. I was digging it. Third, I was in. Yep. Then third one is celebrate growth. Hardest thing we do in this life is grow. And make that choice. When you're in the weight room, it's the 13th rep. It's push until you fail. It's extra weight on the bar, right? Too many times we think we're doing work and growing when all we're doing is just going to where we're discomfort and then we stop. And there's David Goggins quote where he says, there's no growth in the comfort zone. That's right. And and that's what this is about. You got to grow. You got to grow. And when you do, that's when you throw your parties. That's when you celebrate. That's when you sit back and say, man, I went on a sales call. And I'm, I, you know, I knocked the door and then uh, I wasn't ready for that. And I did great. All right. Celebrate the growth, not success. People ask me all the time, Don, why would you celebrate growth and not success? And I believe God sent all of us here to be successful. That's why we were sent here. Doesn't mean we're all sent here to be billionaires, but success is what you define success as. And we were all defined. We were all sent here to be successful. So why would I celebrate you meeting expectations? Right. It doesn't make any sense. You're meeting your potential. And when you start to celebrate expectations, it creates entitlement. So I'm expecting you to be successful. Great job. Okay. But what I'm going to celebrate is the growth to get there. Hmm. The hard things. That's where I'm going to celebrate like crazy. That's the third state. And then the fourth one is my favorite. It's called crush mediocrity. In Florida, and I know in Atlanta, we have enormous bugs and I don't care how clean your house is. You've got big old bugs that love to hang out. And when a roach cockroach comes running around, we've got this thing in our house called the lonely flip-flop that somewhere it lost its partner and it's just hanging out. And we use that to get rid of these bugs. And when you see it, I don't know if you guys have ever done this, you see a cockroach and you smack it. If you don't hit it hard, that cockroach is going to laugh at you and then go call all of his friends and be like, man, Don's a wuss, come on over. We've got the run of the place. You have to crush it with everything you've got. And that's what we do with mediocrity. When you find it, be violent, be upset, and crush it and move on. That's good stuff. C's. Yep. We've been talking about it. That's good stuff. You've been working with companies. So you know, out of the call, some, you know, you still are a partner in businesses, but you're also doing coaching. Let's talk a little bit before we go into our final four questions, a little bit more about 
your coaching program and how people can find you and, and, and what you've been doing with some of these companies. Yeah. So, um, our business, right. Um, we are accountability now is, uh, we were recognized last year as inc.com, one of their top five management consultant companies in the country for our work. Congratulations. Um, Yep. And, uh, and that was a big win for us. We just won another a marketing award with a company called ClickFunnels that we just won. Um, our program is very different than just traditional coaching or traditional consulting. We follow what I call the player coach model. Player coach model. Is, many coaches want to sit on the sidelines and remind you of all the problems you already existed. Well, thanks for helping. Okay. I already know I suck. Okay. And consultants People sometimes want to charge these exorbitant fees to come in and do slow paced work. Well, we don't, we do a player coach model, which means we're going to work with our clients. Everything is month to month. We never sign a long-term contract ever, which means the risk is always on us to perform you again, a sports metaphor guys in their free agent year outperform right? like crazy. So we put that on our us like, Hey, we got to deliver every single day, no matter what we could lose the account. And, we're player coaches. At times, I'm going to sit with the CEO and say, you're the problem, and let's fix that. And then at other times, I'm going to say, hey, uh, let's jump in. Let's solve it. Let's come up. Let's let's do strategy. Let's do training. Let's train your team. Let's design the process. And we will jump in and get our hands dirty. And it's been great. We have 71 clients right now in seven countries. And we are we're having our best year we've ever had as a business. And uh, it's been outstanding. How many weeks a year are you on the road now? Uh, I don't travel. You know, I with the, I have a current engagement that's a pretty great and great engagement that puts me traveling during the summer one week a month. And then outside of that, I probably travel, I don't know, 15 times a year, maybe, right? And yeah. but most it's of the a different season. Virtual, yeah, yeah. yeah, most of the time it's almost always virtual. Yeah. And and, you know, I'm in a different season back in the early days of my career. You know, we had little, little kids. And now my wife works in the business, right? She's got her own portfolio of clients. And um, and her primary specialty is medical. And she does a lot of stuff in, in the medical, any medical practices. I think she works with them. And she's outstanding. She's, again, she's the smartest and toughest person I know. That's awesome. So accountability now, that's how you can find them. Uh, yeah, accountabilitynow.net. You can find me at accountabilitynow.net. Uh, we do a lot on Instagram, executivecoach.don. And uh, and I, I do want to say people should read your book, right? Like um, when I Look first started- Look at Chris that, Beam. So, no, and I mean you. this though, but what- and, Uh-oh. Oh, oh no, he froze. When I was that first business, and when I was failing out and all that stuff. Oh, did I freeze? Can you, you hear me? Did. Yeah, you right did. when you right when you're right about when to say why it's you, a good part. Yeah, oh, you were going to gush on yeah. Chris's book. Yeah. And, then we, so, yeah, and the universe yeah. just said, yeah. no, we can't no. stroke Chris's so, ego anymore. Chris needs stroking. <laughs> when I started that first business and we were failing, there was no podcasts. There, was, there wasn't, right? You know how I got help was to start calling people like, dude, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do, right? And if there had been a show like this where I could have said, you know, and listened and listened to insights and listen to things that other people are doing like, holy cow, that would have helped. And Chris's book really simplifies it. I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, kind of a dumb fashion, right? So anybody can read yeah, it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Small words, big picture. That's exactly yeah. what I went for. Guys. But my, but my point is, is, I mean, we were trying to read Jim Collins. We were trying to read stuff that was, you know, super high level. And we're like, we're not a fortune 500 company. Like what the heck? You know, we've got 10 employees. And so um, I appreciate the work that you do. People don't realize the work that goes into putting on a podcast, even as crappy as this one. And there's so much work behind it. And it's it's really a value to the entrepreneurship community. And I think that's cool. Yeah, man. No, it's been great. Yeah, actually just got a phone with the guy uh, two days ago sure. who uh, just, I because I put it out there. Anybody wants to talk to me, you, you can, you know, yeah, hit me up on email. And I'll give you 30 minutes and we'll just chat, you know, again, put it out there for free. And I did, I talked to this guy, he's thinking about, you know, starting his own handyman company in Spokane, Washington. And he asked the question, he goes, Chris, uh, do you think I'm crazy? I'm like, oh yeah, of course. hundred <laughs> percent. I said, now you got to just got to figure out if it's the right crazy for you, man. I said, cause it's a, it's, it's this crazy hard world that you get into. And, and we talked through it a little bit and he had, he actually had listened to the podcast and I said, you know, you got to have some interesting questions. Make me ask, uh, make, make me answer some, uh, 
pointed questions. And he did. He said, I got my, got my three questions for you because I, I know I only have 30 minutes. So that's pretty cool. Good for so you. There you go. I was a mini coach for 30 minutes. So anyway, awesome. but now we have the man coach on today, uh, Don, who has helped me out quite a bit uh, as we hit, put the 10 for 2 program in at this trusted toolbox. And we're still striving for it and going after it and it's galvanizing the team. So at the toolbox, we have appreciated what Don has done for us. But now we have to go to our final four questions as we bring it to a close. So you've brought up a lot of books and you've read a lot of books and I'm, I'm well aware of that. What is one book now you would, ref, you would uh, give out to our audience looking to start a business, looking to scale a business, but just a book. Yep. Um, I, so I'm, I'm a big reader. I read, you know, somewhere between 60 and 80 books a year. Right. Um, but I reread every May, the 10 X rule by Grant Cardone every May 1st. Um, and the reason why is, look, that's a, that's heavy sales, heavy entrepreneurship, heavy mindset. And the reason why is because you set your big goals in January, you get your word of the year, you get all this stuff. And then you get to the end of April and you're like, man, I'm tired. What the freak am I working on? Like, I'm so exhausted. And so every May 1st, I read it again. And mm-hmm. I just realized, holy crap, I have so much more I can do. Let's go. That's a great and one I, too. That's a yeah, great time I, frame to do it into. Yeah. And I've done that probably 15 years. I've reread that book May 1st every year. Solid. All right, here we go. Now on to the uh, the next three. Questions. Why don't you incorporate my question into the three? I mean, there there are four questions. You don't have to I, separate them. I said four. Now we have three left. And you're like, okay, now we're going to get to the three that are important. <laughs> What's the favorite feature of your house, Don? Uh, my favorite feature of my house. Well, we put in a pool. Uh, it took a year and a half to get the pool in place. Uh, Chris and I remember we they were just starting down that path, and we had. They, they cut a pipe and I, we were chatting on a call and he's like, did they do this? And he went right into like working yeah. on it. And so there was just nothing like sitting out there at the pool with my kids. And, and I just love it. That's what yeah. I love. That's awesome. Love that. That's a good one. Okay. When you're out there uh, in the world and we're getting customer service, you know, we, things are out there in the world because we are customer service freaks. We want to know what is a customer service pet peeve of yours? Uh, you're, the, you're the customer. Yeah. So customer service is about creating magical experiences. That's all it is. Just create magic. It's all I want you to do is create magic. Um, you don't have to solve my dang problem. Just create magic. Make it feel good. Right. Because remember, magic's not real. It's never real. But we love it because of the way it makes us feel. So customer service sometimes thinks I just got to get right to the problem. I got to solve it. Wrong. Make it magical. Just create magic. And then, because there's a lot of times you do, can't solve it. Sometimes you got to tell the customer, like, it is what it is. I don't know what to tell you, right? But if I can make it magical, it doesn't matter if it's real. You're going to walk away and remember it. And when they don't make it magical, they just kind of, da, 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 even when they solve my problem right away. That's why I like to call Disney with a problem, because Disney's going to make it magical. And yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I, I like that, too. It, um, it's, again, because we all know that's how you feel at the end of that transaction, not at the data that came out of it. All right, last thing. Give us a DIY nightmare story that did not involve those guys cutting your sprinkler. Yeah, this is a DIY. This one's great. So my wife loves to know, and she, they joke around about it, that I'm the least handy person in the world. And so we get, uh, we've got our house. We've got an upstairs part of our house and stuff like that. And I see on Amazon uh, Prime Day. It's, it's Prime Day right now, but it was Prime Day years ago. It was like six years ago these little outlets that had USBs in them. And I'm like, I'm going to install USB outlets in our whole house. Genius. So I order two of them and I tell my wife, I'm going to put these through the whole house. And she's like, like hell you are, right? You're a mess. And I was like, no, trust me. I watched a YouTube video. I'm going to do this. She goes, why don't you start upstairs? So I go upstairs. Now you guys do this stuff all the time. How long should that have taken? I'd say an hour for an amateur in the beginning. Yeah, to do the two, I would give you an hour. Yeah. So, no, I'm not exaggerating. Four hours later, our power was out in the whole house. We had no power <laughs> at all, and we're freaking out. And I have no idea what to do. Like, I it is gone. I have no idea. Nothing's installed. I got cords hanging out of a wall. I got crazy stuff. We had to call an electrician. He came for about an hour, and he was saying, "Like, what were you?" Why were you twisting these? What what were you doing? I looked at the YouTube video. I swear, said to do all of this. <laughs> Where YouTube and, video said white goes to black, <laughs> yeah, green goes and, to black. <laughs> yep. And so they came. And he was there about an hour. He got it fixed. And he goes, "Do you want me to install these?" And I said, "No, throw them away. We're done. We're banned." 
all together. <laughs> and that's what it was. And they bring it up all the time. Like when I get a little like, I'm going to do a DIY thing. Don, do you remember? Remember the outlets? <laughs> like, you're right. You're right. We're going to call. Somebody it's like, remember outlets. the Titans. Remember the outlets, Don. Remember the yeah. outlets. Oh, go away. Right. Go away. Yeah. So yeah, this has been go. awesome. I, I tell you, we, we've we talked about this on other podcasts. That when do you need a coach? When do you want to get a coach? It it just depends on where you are. I've used uh, a couple of coaches throughout my my 15 years doing it, and Don has been the, the one I've used most recently uh, who helped. And so I think a big question a lot of people ask themselves is, when should I get a coach? When shouldn't I get a coach? And I would answer for Don is that, when you're ready, it's time to at least find out, but don't just follow somebody and just because you found them on Instagram, get to know the guys, get to understand who they are and can they really help you? And that's where Don uh, was a great fit for me at the time. I was uh, looking for this kind of coaching from him to help me really uh, accelerate my growth in my company. So as you go to grow and get your company going, you got to make sure you're looking for the right people to help you, but you got to keep rolling it, right? Yeah. And it's really interesting to me because not not too long ago, Don was talking about, you know, and I'm talking to the CEO and if, if they're the problem, then I tell them they're the problem. And we just had a coach not too many episodes ago who wouldn't have done that unless they got permission to. And I kind of have a feeling Don would have just told you. So there's a huge difference in styles of coaches. Do you want somebody who's in your face, tell you like it is, or do you want somebody who's more of a yeah. therapist? Yeah. Well, and I'll, I'll say two quick things. I know we're running along here, but two quick things to remember on that. One is... Uh, remember the law of entropy. This is a scientific law. The law of entropy is every anything left unto itself is in a constant state of decay. Okay, that is true as anything. Those shirts you're wearing, they're constantly getting older. Right, everything we have is in a constant state of decay when it's left unto itself, including our ability to be successful. And I would tell everyone, if you don't have a coach, then how are you getting better? You think you're that good? You're the one entrepreneur. You know, every great successful entrepreneur in his, like in the last 50 years has had a coach and you just think you're the one that doesn't need them. Or is that your ego telling you that? Right. Right. And so every great athlete, every great actor, every, every single one has had somebody they go to that coaches them. But you're apparently better than Tiger Woods. You're apparently <laughs> the one that doesn't need a coach. Good for you. Cause you're full of crap, right? You're full of crap. Everyone needs a coach. That's now, right. There are, you know, there if you're are a great styles. quarterback in high school. You have one coach. You may have two. You may have a quarterback's coach. You go to college and you immediately pick up a strength and conditioning coach, a quarterback's coach, an Everyone offensive of coordinator. A, you, and then you get to, by the time you get to the pros, you've got, you got all kinds of nutrition coach. You got everything. Mindset coaches. Yeah. Think about so, Wimby. The guy, the number one draft pick for the Spurs, right? You know how many people he's probably got around him coaching him now, right? Like to help him as opposed to where he was at. Yeah. And, but, but for some reason, business owners, entrepreneurs, they think, well, I got it. I'm good. I'm the one person that doesn't need help. I know well, so many liar. of those guys too. That's exactly yeah. right. And so always, always, always have a coach always and make sure it fits your budget. Make sure it fits your style. Okay. Make sure it's, make sure it's somebody that's pushing you into uncomfort zone. Make sure. And if they're not, then they're not a coach. They're just a friend. Right. You don't right. you don't need to hire a friend. You need to hire somebody that'll tell you, hey, put more weight on the bar. I think you could take the business to 10 million. I think you I think you're wrong. We got to go to 10 million and let's go. Let's and do it. That's what you need. You can do it too, everybody. Take us and I hope you guys got some good stuff on this one. Go check out the show notes. Go out there, man. And just do me a favor. I just asked two of my good friends to go out there after they told me, Hey, I really liked your podcast. I said, Can you go out there and give me a review? I just went and checked yesterday. You know what? No, they, they didn't do it. No. You know what? They're off my friend list. They're gone. No, I'm kidding. But Slash you go out their there. tires. You go out there and you give me a good review and I'll become your friend. All right, Don, thanks so much for taking time out of your very busy day. We enjoyed it. And I hope everybody else got a lot out of this one because I know I sure did. I got a page full of notes. We'll see awesome. you on the thanks, next guys. one. Thanks, Don. Cheers. Out of here.